Okay, guys, so we're going to pick up with Among the Hidden. Um, this is the book that I started reading to you yesterday. Um, if you remember, um, this is taking place in America in the future. Um, there is a law that you can only have um, two children. Um, and then they kind of ensure that you don't have a third. Um, we don't really have the details as to how they do that, but we know that you're not supposed to have a third. Um, and so they have a third. Luke is their third child, and so Luke has to stay hidden all the time. Um, because there are population police who go around to make sure that you only have two children. Um, and so that's kind of where we just picked up. It's kind of that, you know, just basic information. Um, and so now we are going to read chapters three and four today. Luke lay on his stomach on the floor and idly ran the toy train back and forth on the track. The train had belonged to Dad when he was a little boy, and his own father before him. Luke could remember a time when his greatest longing had been for Mark to outgrow the train so Luke could have it all to himself. But it wasn't what he wanted to play with today. There was a beautiful day unfolding outside, with fleecy clouds in the blue, blue sky, and a mild breeze rustling the grass in the backyard. He hadn't left the house in a week now, and he could almost hear the outdoors calling him. But now he wasn't even allowed to be in the same room as an uncovered window. Are you trying to be discovered? Dad had bellowed at Luke just that morning when he'd held the shade a few inches back from the kitchen window and peeked out longingly. Luke jumped. He'd been so busy thinking about, the running, about running barefoot through the grass that he'd half forgotten that there was anyone or anything behind him in the house. No one's out there, he said, glancing again to be sure. He'd been trying not to look beyond the ragged edge of the backyard to the bulldozed mess of branches, trunks, leaves, and mud that had once been his beloved woods. Yeah, Dad said. Did it ever occur to you that if there is, they might see you before you see them? He grabbed Luke by the arm and jerked him back a good three feet, freed from Luke's grasp that the bottom of the shade banged against the windowsill. You can't look out at all, Dad said. I mean it. From now on, just stay away from the windows and don't go into a room unless you've got the shades or curtains pulled. But then I can't see anything, Luke protested. Better that than to get turned in, Dad said. Dad sounded like he might feel sorry for Luke, but that only made things work. worse. Luke turned around and left, scared he might cry in front of Dad. Now he gave the toy train a shove and it careened off the track. It landed upside down, wheels spinning. Who cares, Luke muttered. There was a harsh knock on the door. Population police, open up! Luke didn't move. That's not funny, Mark, he shouted. Mark opened the door and bounded up the stairs that led to Luke's room proper. Luke's room was also the attic, a fact he had never minded. Mother long ago had shoved all the trunks and boxes as far as they could go under the eaves, leaving prime space for Luke's brass bed and circular rag rug and books and toys. Luke had even heard Matthew and Mark grumble about Luke having the biggest room, but they had windows. Scared you this time, didn't I, Mark asked. No, Luke said. Nothing would force him to admit that his heart had jumped. Mark had been playing the population police joke for years, always out of their parents' earshot. Usually, Luke just ignored Mark, but now, with ac Dad acting so skittish, what would Luke have done if it really had been the population police? What would they do to him? Matt and me, we've never told anyone about you, Mark said, suddenly serious, which was strange for him. And you and old mother and dad don't say anything. You're good at hiding, so you're safe, you know? I know, Luke might. Mark kicked the toy train Luke had crashed. Still playing with baby toys, he asked, as if to make up for slipping and being nice. Luke shrugged. Normally, he wouldn't have wanted Mark to know he played with the train anymore. But today, everything else was so bad that it didn't matter. Did you come here just to bug me, Luke asked. Mark put on an offended look. Thought you might want to play checkers, he said. Luke squinted. Mother told you to, right, he said. No. You're lying, Luke said, not caring how nasty he sounded. Well, if you're just going to be that way, just leave me alone, okay? Okay, okay. Mark backed down the stairs. Jeez. Alone again, Luke felt a little sorry he'd been so mean. Maybe Mark had told the truth. Luke should apologize. But he didn't really feel like it. Luke got up and started pacing the room. The squeak of the third board in from the stairs annoyed him. He hated having to duck under the rafters on the far side of his bed. His favorite model cars lined up on the shelves in the corner bothered him today. Why should he have model cars? He never even sat in a real one. He never would. 
He'd never do, get to do anything or go anywhere. He might as well just rot up here in the attic. He thought about that before, on the rare occasions when Mother, Dad, Matthew, and Mark all went somewhere and left him behind. What if something happened to them and they never came back? Would someone find him years from now, abandoned and dead? He'd read a story in one of the old books in the attic about a bunch of kids finding a deserted pirate ship and then a skeleton in one of the rooms. He'd be like that skeleton. And now that he wasn't allowed in rooms with uncovered windows, he'd be a skeleton in the dark. Luke looked up automatically, as if to remind himself that nothing lit the rafters but a single bulb over his head. Except, there was a light at either end of the ceiling, leaking in from under the peaked roof. Luke stood up and went to investigate. Of course, he should have remembered. There were vents at each end of the roof. Dad grumbled occasionally about heating the attic for Luke. It's just like throwing money out of those vents. But Mother always fixed him with one of her stairs and nothing changed. Now Luke climbed on one of the largest trunks and looked down through the vent. He could see out. He could see a strip of the road and the cornfield beyond, its leaves waving in the breeze. The vent slanted down and limited his view, but at least he was sure nobody would be able to see him. For a moment, Luke was excited, but that quickly faded. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life watching the corn grow. Without much hope, he stepped down from the trunk and went to the other side of the attic, the portion that faced the backyard. He had to slide boxes around and drag an old step stool from the opposite end of the attic, but finally his eyes were level with the back vent. The view was not of the backyard, it was too close, but of the former woods. He'd never realized it before, but the land there sloped away from his family's house, so he had a clear view of acres and acres that once had been covered with trees. The land was abuzz with activity now. Huge yellow bulldozers shoved brush back from the rough road that had been traced out with gravel. Other vehicles Luke couldn't identify were digging holes for huge concrete pipes. Luke watched in fascination. He knew tractors and combines, of course, and had seen his dad's bush hog and manure spreader and gravity wagons up close in the barn. These machines were different, designed for different jobs, and they were all operated by different people. Once when Luke was younger, a tramp had walked up to the house and Luke had only had time to hide under the sink in the mudroom before the man was in the house, begging for food. The door of the cabinet was cracked, so Luke had been able to peek out and see the man's patched trousers and holy shoes. He heard his whiny voice, I ain't got no job, I ain't eaten three days. No, no, I can't do no farm work for my food. What do you think I am? I'm sick, I'm starving. Other than that tramp and pictures and books, Luke had never seen another human being beside his parents and Matthew and Mark. He had never dreamed they were such variety. So imagine the only people you have ever seen are the people in your house. That's where, that's where Luke's at. Many of the people running the bulldozers and shovel contraptions were stripped of their shirts, while others standing nearby wore ties and coats. Some were fat and some were thin, some were browned by the sun, and some were paler than Luke himself, who would never be tan again. They were all moving, shifting gears and lowering pipe, waving others in position, or at the very least, talking in full speed. All that activity made Luke dizzy. The pictures and books always showed people still. Overwhelmed, Luke closed his eyes, then opened them again for fear of missing something. Luke? Reluctantly, Luke slid down from his step stool perch and scrambled over to recline innocently on his bed. Come in, he called to his mother. She climbed the stairs heavily. You okay? Luke dangled his feet over the side of the bed. Sure, I'm fine. Mother sat on the bed beside him and patted his leg. It's... She swallowed hard. It's not easy, the life you've got to live. I know you'd like to look outside. You'd like to go outside and... That's okay, Luke, Mother Luke said. He could have told her then about the vents. He didn't see how anyone could object to him looking out there. But something stopped him. What if they took that away from him too? What if Mother told Dad and Dad said, No, no, that's too much of a risk. I forbid it. Luke wouldn't be able to stand it. He kept silent. Mother ruffled his hair. You're a trooper, she said. I know you'd hold up all right. Luke leaned against his mother's arm and she moved her arm around his shoulders and hugged him tight to her side. He felt a little guilty for keeping a secret, but mostly reassured, loved, and reassured. Then, more to himself than, herself than to him, Mother added, and things could be worse. Somehow that wasn't comforting. Luke didn't know why, but he had a feeling what she really meant was that things were going to get worse. He snuggled tighter against Mother, hoping he was wrong.